Hi, I'm Richard Lang and this is my friend Judy Bruce that I've known for many years and uh, Judy and I are going to talk about her experience of seeing. Hello. Hello Richard. <laughs> Hi Judy. <laughs> so how did it start? What drew you to seeing in the first place? It was Zen. Zen drew me um, quite by chance actually. Uh, I was in Japan and I came across Alan Watts's book, The Way of Zen, which I read on the bullet train going to uh, Tokyo. And I thought, gosh, this is something I really want. I want to be enlightened. Hmm. Um, so what year was this? How, how old were you? It was 1968. 68? Yeah. And um, I was 29. And I'd been travelling in um, overland to India and then Australia. I'd been in, in Hong Kong and then I was just passing through Japan. But I read this book and it said meditate. And uh, I thought, well, I'm in the place of meditation, so I better you know, find a place to meditate and a master, you know, and all that. So I, I found, I, I, I changed my plans and I stayed for three months in Japan and I went to a monastery and I did, was sitting and um, the koan that I was given was the koan mu, you know, what is mu, what is nothingness, mm. what is nothing, uh, which I couldn't make any head or tail of. And I, I actually, during that time, I read Douglas's book on having no head and couldn't make any sense of it at all because I, w I had already got the idea that I must um, spend seven years in Japan, learn Japanese, sit in the robes, you know, and do all that stuff. And then I might be ready to get enlightened. Mm. But um, I came home for Christmas, intending to go back. And uh, my friend, Sarah, who, who I knew from the overland trip, she said, go and see Douglas Harding. He knows about Zen. She'd already met Douglas. She had at the ashram in India. Um, to River Namai. So I went, uh, I rang him up and he said, oh, come to visit me in Ipswich. And he collected me from the station and he took me to his house, to Andersholland. We sat down and he, he, you know, there was the usual preamble. And then he said, what are you looking out of? And there was this white bearded, rather imposing man and I thought oh, he's gone off his head <laughs> um, and I said well my eyes sort of adding of course mentally and he said what nonsense and I was so shocked and that I instantly stopped thinking and I stared at him and I said I'm looking out of nothing and then Penny dropped you know my koan Mm. And so you, in that moment, became aware of, of your single eye, so to speak. I became aware of being empty and clear and just being. And you recognised it for what you'd been looking for. I don't know that I... well... I knew that it was the answer to the koan, and obviously that must, you know, have meant a lot. But what happened after that was when I read the scriptures, the Buddhist scriptures, which I hadn't understood, I understood them. Mm. And that was really significant. Mm. And I said, that's too simple. And he said, you know, everybody says that. <laughs> and, uh, um, and he invited me back for the weekend, and it kind of went from there. So where did it go from there for you, Judy? What, what happened? It's uh, more than 40 years ago. Well, a lot of things happened. Um, I was still very keen on this idea of being enlightened, which I saw as being perfect, you know, perfect human being. But Douglas gave me a different way of looking at it, which was that, you know, our perfection, this is perfection, Mm. And that the human being is flawed or whatever, you know, the human being is made up of a mixture of things which some people say is are flaws and some of virtues and all that. And um, it's okay as it is. 
that was really important for me, this, this idea that here my true nature is perfect without sin, really. Catholic upbringing, <laughs> you know, all that stuff. So did that take the pressure off you having to be perfect as Judy then? Absolutely, yeah, because Judy was all right as she is um, and perfection doesn't lie in trying to make Judy perfect in herself. Mm. And that was rather significant for me because of my background and things about me. And has that continued to play its part in your life, a, a kind of ongoing acceptance of Judy? Well, yes. Uh, I think what I did was uh, something that happens to people who get on the spiritual path quite um, often happens. I, I separated the two. You know, Judy was there in the mirror and I could ignore her and I could just be my spaciousness and spaced out, hopefully. <laughs> Over the years I've come to realise that, no, that's not how it works and that uh, it was in, very important for me, actually, to accept Judy as she is, you know, to, to own her, to, to um, stop kind of doing this disembodied and devoid of care sort of stunt because I wasn't devoid of care. Mm. I still had loads of cares and problems and, you know, the usual thing that life is made up of and I had to deal with it in some way or another. And um, a lot of my problems, as with most of us, I'm sure, to do with relationships and getting on with people. And because of my upbringing, I found that quite difficult, you know, to get on with people, to, the rough and tumble and the interchange and accepting things about me that people don't like and all that kind of stuff. So seeing this uh, helps you in that process of accepting all sides of Judy? Well, eventually, eventually, I came to realise that uh, it was quite important to actually listen to what people say in my relationships, to listen to what people say about me, critical things, <laughs> and to, to take them on board, you know, and to actually realise that, yeah, okay, perfection might reside here, but in other people's eyes, perfection in this part, you know, is, is not happening, let's say. Um, in Judy. In Judy, yeah, in, in general lovingness, you know. And so I had to listen to that. And Douglas, um, Douglas was not keen on psychotherapy. And I would say that that had been partly connected because it was a long time ago when he was sort of learning about psychotherapy. It's changed a lot and, and I have done quite a bit of coming to ter talking to myself in the presence of somebody else mm. and sorting myself out mm. as Judy and owning me as Judy and trying to become effective in action, let's say. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And uh, to me, I know you, Judy, and, and seeing, it seems to me, is at the very core of your life and, and mm. it's affecting you in, in different areas of your life. I, I wonder, what, why do you think it's, it has appealed to you so centrally? Yeah. Well, there are two things. Um, Douglas's two approaches to what we are, the, the scientific and the spiritual, the religious, um, just up my street. I mean, those have been the two um, paths, I suppose, that I've followed. I was a biologist and then a teacher of biology, and I've always been very religious. You know, I, I was baptised three times, and so I think that probably <laughs> made it, <laughs> you know, made it stick. So on the um, one hand, the, the scientific validity of seeing has appealed to you. Absolutely. It? That's yes. what you're saying. Yes. Yes. That it makes sense in terms of modern science. It makes sense in modern science and um, it's not contradictory. You know, the two aspects, uh, the two ways home, as Douglas puts it, of science and religion are completed by seeing and unified by seeing. That's the important part.
you know, you're not left with an either or. They both make sense in terms of each other, if you see from here. And what it means, you know, the meaning of these experiments is very important for me. Mm. And you're involved in organising the summer gathering. Why does that appeal to you? I've always thought it's really, really important that we should come together and meet together and um, be a community, yes, of, of people who've, and reinforce, and, and it's, in my life, it's been very important in reinforcing and bringing me back as I stray away and get involved in other things and get all muddled in my no head. <laughs> and um, to get back to the sheer clarity of it, all the, t all the times we had summer gatherings when Douglas was alive, he would always come up with a new angle, and it was so fascinating and great to have the contributions of other people f as well. And now he's no longer here with us. Um, it's still going on, and I think this is absolutely fantastic. And the fact that people are still coming and more people are coming, you know, it's, it's um, got a... A, a momentum of its own and that's just wonderful. There's something about being with others that yeah. inspires one and reminds one. Yeah, yeah. And to sit down and do the experiments and take the opportunity of, of conducting them and, and having other people do them as well. Yes, it's good practice. I found in trying to share this with people that generally I've come unstuck <laughs> and probably um, ended up with more friends thinking I was <laughs> off the wall. A bit mad. Yeah, off the wall. So it's it's wonderful to be with a big group of people and do the experiments with everybody positive and, and you know, getting a lot out of it. What do you hope from seeing, I don't know if this is a, a valid question or not, but what do you hope from seeing for your future? From seeing, I don't know that I hope for anything. Um, I do find myself thinking that we've been given, you and me and all Douglas's friends, have been given something so extraordinary, you know, this teaching which has actually transformed my life and other people's and is so appropriate for others. I do think we have... Um, I suppose laid on us the the um, the, the task of, of spreading it if we can. So but you're drawn to making it more available. Absolutely, in the world. yes, I am, because I find it helps me. And if you were to put it as simply as you can, what would you say you're sharing? who I am, who I really, really am. Can't say more than that, really. <laughs> hmm. It's wonderful being built <clears throat> open for the world. It's wonderful being um, not a thing in the world, but the world being in me. Why? because it frees me from all those limitations. It frees me to be happy in the world, content in the world and with the world, and to be, um, I suppose, not burdened by, you know, the life lived from who one is as a little one, only that. It's, it's, it's as, as one gets older, it becomes, you know, not a, very, not a very nice prospect. But from this perspective, from this point of view, there's peace and light, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Peace and light and, and cheerfulness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Judy.